Hello, my name is Jeremiah Grazza, and I am the owner of President Gator. I was also the director of operations for Stateside Presents, and I am currently a talent buyer for Live Nation. I started promoting concerts back in 2001. It started by a couple of friends of mine from high school, started a band, and I had my own apartment at U of A. So we thought that it'd be fun if we set up a little concert in my living room of my apartment and charge people $5 to come in. We'd have a keg and we'd see what happens. Enough people came that I was able to cover my rent that month. So we we're like, all right, let's uh, do this again next month. So we did it again. More people showed up. Eventually it got so big that we needed to move it somewhere else outside of the apartment. So we started looking around Tucson and seeing how much venues were to rent. And if we charged, you know, $5 and we could get, you know, hundred people to show up, could we cover the rent and maybe make some money? We ended up looking around, did a couple of shows, did pretty well and we made some money. And then it was college, it was summer vacation. We came back up to Phoenix and the band asked if I wanted to be their manager. And I said, sure. So what we started doing was looking for places to play in Phoenix. Went and recorded a little four song demo. So we would have something to show people at the clubs. This was uh, before Spotify and MySpace and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. So you had to have an actual physical recording to take to venues to show people, this is my band, this is what we sound like. Charlie Levy ended up giving us an opportunity at Nita's Hideaway. He said that he would give us a Monday night and if the bar did well enough, we could do another event. We found a bunch of other local bands in town. We asked if they wanted to play, made a flyer, we worked with Zia Records to put up posters and hand out flyers at all the Zia Records. And I ended up doing my first show in Phoenix. It was a big enough success that we were allowed to come back and do it again. And then from there, uh, other local bands started saying, hey, you know, do you think you can help us put together a show? Started doing little local band showcases, different spots throughout the valley. And eventually that led to local bands saying, hey, I've got some friends in California. Do you think we could do a show for our friends in California? So I said, sure, why not? One of those bands was a band that was about to sign to drive through records called Hello Goodbye. And so we said, all right, let's put together a little show. We, ha we added some local bands, it did great. And then eventually that band said, hey, we've got some other friends from California that are looking to do a show you think you could help them out. Uh, ended up being a band like Steel Train with Jack Antonoff and saying, hey, do you think you could do a couple of shows for us? So I started doing all the shows for them as well. And eventually just word of mouth spread to the point where the shows got bigger and bigger and I started competing with other promoters in town. Eventually, one of those other promoters was Charlie Levy, who after Anita's Hideaway closed, started his own promotion company called Stateside Presents. Eventually, the acts that I started booking got large enough that they had real booking agents and those real booking agents started working, which had relationships with Charlie Levy but I had had the history in the market booking the bands. So uh, a band like Steel Train, their booking agent would hit up Charlie and say, hey, we have Steel Train coming to town. Do you want to do the show? Charlie would come to me and say, hey, I know that you've done the show before. Do you want to co-promote the show? So I started a working relationship with Stateside Presents, co-promoting shows to the point where eventually Charlie and I were co-promoting 250, 300 shows a year. At which point Charlie asked if I would come on and be the director of operations for Stateside Presents, which I said, sure, why not? So together uh, I was doing about 250 shows a year. Charlie was doing maybe another 250 shows a year. So together, and this was in 2013, we started doing about 500 shows a year. And this was before the Crescent Ballroom. This was before Valley Bar. We were doing shows at Modified Arts, the Rhythm Room, the Clubhouse, the Marquee, a bunch of old venues in, in Arizona that 
Some exist, some don't exist anymore. And we started growing that from 500 shows a year to 600 shows a year to 750 shows a year. And eventually it got to the point where uh, we needed our own space to be doing the shows. So um, Charlie found a spot in downtown Phoenix, uh, which eventually became the Crescent Ballroom ended up opening up that and we were able to start doing our shows in our own owned and operated room. A couple of years later, opened up uh, Valley Bar and then a few years after that ended up opening the Van Buren. A few years after the Van Buren opened, we started getting attention from a larger promotion company called Live Nation. They're a publicly traded corporation. They are the largest promotion company in the world. They started taking notice of what Charlie and I were doing and offered to buy Charlie and the Van Buren out. Uh, with that, I ended up becoming a talent buyer for Live Nation, essentially doing the same thing, booking a concert and negotiating the deal and promoting the show in Phoenix. So you might be asking yourself, what is a talent buyer and what does a talent buyer do? So essentially, uh, when an act wants to come and play in your market, they usually have a booking agent and their booking agent will contact a talent buyer, myself, and say, we have such and such band wanting to play Phoenix during these dates. Can you get us some holds? So depending on the size of the band, we'll find an appropriate room for them to play. Uh, if it's a smaller band, we'll look at Crescent Ballroom. If it's a little larger band, we'll look at the Van Buren. If it's a larger band, we'll look at Arizona Financial Theater. They'll say the band's looking to come February 1st through the 5th. So we will contact the venue, we'll place some holds, we'll send those holds back to the agent, and then at that point, they'll ask for a mutually agreeable offer. They'll usually set some parameters. They'll say, we're looking for tickets around 30 to $40. We need $500 for support. We need $1,000 for catering. And they'll kind of give you some parameters. And then from there, you have to determine how many people you think that band is worth in your market. And at that point, offer a fair guarantee to the agent and the artist. So I'll come up with a guarantee and say, I think that this band can do a thousand tickets in the market, will hold the Van Buren, and I'll offer the band what I think is appropriate, a thousand times the ticket price, and usually offer them around 60% of that. Uh, the other 40% is used to cover your expenses, your rent, your security, your catering, your advertising, your sound and light tech, your runner, etc. And then hopefully you leave a 10 to 15% profit margin for yourself. It's not a lot, but if the show does well, you do well. And also you do enough shows over the year ends up being okay. That's kind of what a talent buyer does in general across the United States. Working for yourself or a smaller independent versus working for a larger company, when you are smaller and independent, you kind of take on more responsibilities than you would working for somebody else or working for a larger corporation. So when, you, when you're doing it by yourself, you are literally doing everything. You are doing the contract. You are making the flyer. You are printing the flyer. You are running the ads on Instagram and Google. You are signing the contract and sending it back. When the band comes to town, you're running the show. You're the one there settling at the end of the night, paying the band. And at the end of the show, you're sending the finals to the agent. You're, you're do, when, you, when you're running it yourself, you're doing everything yourself. Working for a medium-sized company, it gets broken down. You still do a little bit more. At Stateside Presents, we had some, at the beginning, 
Charlie and I did all the contracts ourselves. We did all the flyers ourselves. We settled all the shows ourselves. Eventually we grew to the point where we could hire somebody to handle the contracts, handle the deposits and settle some of the shows. And then after that, we eventually were able to hire a marketing person who was able to create the flyers, run the ads, do the marketing. And then eventually we were able to hire some more production people and somebody could be there to settle the shows to the point where eventually Charlie and I were just buying, were just the talent buyers, dealing with the agents, negotiating the deals, buying the shows and sending the settlements at the end. At the largest scale, Live Nation is essentially all I do at this point. Um, I'm, I just negotiate the deal with the agent and I don't worry about the marketing and advertisement. I don't worry about the contracts and deposits. I don't worry about settling the show at the end of the night. I exclusively have the one-on-one -on -one relationship with the agent. Now at this point, I was also managing that band that I first started doing the shows for. Eventually the band was like, hey, do you think you can manage us and, and help our career out? So I, I said, sure, why not? We found somebody to record a few songs with. We recorded some demos. We got them mastered. We found a little company that would press CDs for us. We pressed CDs so we would have something to sell at the shows. Uh, we found a local company, Acme Prince, who could make some t-shirts for us. This guy, Dan, was in a cool local band called Pollen, and he was making shirts like in his oven, in his living room. And we're like, hey, Dan, you think you can make some shirts for us? And he was like, yeah, why not? Now Dan has like one of the largest screen printing companies in Arizona, which we still use to this day. So we got some shirts made, we got some CDs made, we started playing shows. Eventually, when bigger national bands started coming to town and asking me to put on shows, I would put the band that I managed on those bigger shows. And they got exposed to a bigger audience and a bigger fan base and built up their following. So it kind of, it was a kind of a symbiotic um, relationship of promoting and managing kind of worked out that one hand washed the other and we were able to the band I managed was able to help some of the smaller national bands and some of the smaller national bands ended up getting bigger to the point where I started co-promoting shows with other local promoters. And then eventually same thing, other local bands started coming to me and saying, hey, do you think you could help manage us? Like, we see you did such a great job with this band. Do you think you can manage us? So I started managing other local bands and kind of doing the same thing. We'd go record a CD, we'd get it mastered, we'd press some CDs, we'd go get some t-shirts made, we'd make some shirts, we'd play these shows, and we'd kind of build up our fan base and our following. Um, eventually, uh, platforms like MySpace came around. So we were able to make MySpace pages and we were able to upload our songs onto our MySpace page and we were able to announce, oh hey, we're playing the show here and this was kind of the beginning of, of social media. Uh, but a lot of it was just word of mouth and physical hand flyers and going to record stores and passing out flyers and going to other shows <clears throat> and passing out flyers and saying, oh, hey, you like this band, you'll like this band. Come on down to the show. And eventually it got to the point where the bands were demanding a lot of time and energy and resources and promoting the shows were demanding a lot of time and energy and resources. And I could, I could only do one. Our, our dream was to get signed to a label and make a big career, but your, your chances of that are very small and slim. So I, you know, I decided that I was going to stick with concert promotion and make that my focus. I would still help some bands out over over the next couple of years, um, but it was it, it was a lot less, and my involvement with the bands uh, got a lot more particular. Over the years, when I first started, I think I was managing, let's see, I was managing James is Dead, Falling Faster, Sparrow, 
Sunrise Elementary, the Hot Guy Band. And eventually that, I ended up dropping all those bands, only managing one band, managing Peach Cake, which became pretty successful nationwide. And then after Peach Cake dissolved, I ended up managing a band, Bogan Via, that became very successful. And then after that, I haven't really managed much um, since then. So I it kind of pared down to be like, okay, I'm gonna help this one band out, you know, with with the resources that I have. But my primary focus went on to promoting concerts. Um, and then once again, as the concerts got bigger and the promotion company got bigger, and I started to merge with Stateside Presents and co-promote with Stateside Presents and then eventually become the director of operations for Stateside Presents. I stopped doing my own shows and I stopped doing the local shows and my focus started really being on national acts and bigger national acts. And so there wasn't much use for President Gator as a promotion company because now I was the director of operations for Stateside Presents. And we still use the name as a management company, but I wasn't really managing a whole lot of bands and the bands that I was managing was kind of few and far between. There were a lot of bands that I really, really liked. And I said, okay, well, I can't manage, I can't manage these bands. I can put them on shows because I'm promoting shows, but what else can, can I do to help these bands? So I decided that I would put my money where my mouth was and start a record label. Why not? You know, I don't have anything else going on. I'm just promoting shows and managing bands. Well, let's start a record label. There were a couple of bands. The, there was one of the bands that I managed, Bogan Via. I said, all right, I really like you guys. I'm managing you. I'm putting you on shows. I'm, you know, we're, we're trying to find a record label, but let's start our own record label. So the first record I put out was for the band I managed. And then there were two other bands that I really liked and I was putting shows together for. And I asked them if they wanted to do a split record. And it was this band called Roar and this band called Gospel Claws. And so my second record was for these two small local bands that I really liked and I really enjoyed. And we pressed a record. It was fantastic, amazing record. And we did an album release party and we promoted it and we started selling it. It did okay, we sold, we sold a few records and it was enough to be like, okay, well, let's, uh, let's start helping some other bands out. And eventually it got to the point where the records were paying themselves off, maybe making a little bit of a profit. And now I've put out about 40 records on my record label and for some pretty cool bands from Arizona a big hip hop band from Arizona called Injury Reserve who ended up getting signed to a major label. I put out their records first. A big indie rock band that got signed to a major label, Equal Vision. Uh, I put out records for Deer in the Headlights. A big a Christian rock band from Arizona that were signed to Tooth and Nail Records, uh, Fine China. I ended up putting out some records for. I did some records for a metal band who got signed to a major label called Gate Creeper, a, a small punk band that ended up blowing up on TikTok after uh, the pandemic called Playboy Man Baby. I did a record for them. It was all bands that I liked their music. It didn't really matter what genre they were. They could be hip hop, they could be country, they could be metal, they could be indie rock, as long as they made good music and they were from Arizona. And that still to this day is the model for my record label. Uh, one, I have to enjoy the music. I have to like the music I'm putting out. Otherwise, why am I putting it out? Two, you know, they have to be a local band from Arizona and, you know, I have to be, be invested in it. And, you know, and it's fun. We do, we do different colored vinyl, we do different runs, we'll do different pressings, and it's, a, it's just a fun project. And that's kind of what President Gator evolved from promoting, band, promoting concerts for local bands, managing local bands, to eventually putting out records for local bands. My day will consist of logging into my emails around 9 a.m., going through and seeing what agents have hit me up, asking for holds for the Phoenix market. I will grab them the holds, and then depending if they're ready, once again, they'll give me the deal terms, 
and I will make an offer and we'll go back and forth negotiating uh, deal terms until we come to a mutually agreeable offer, at which point I will we will confirm the show and I will pass that along to our marketing team, our contracts and deposits team and the venue team to let them know, hey, the show is confirmed. These are the deal points. This is how much the band's getting paid. This is how much the ticket prices are. And then we will set up a time to announce and go on sale. We'll build a ticket link. We'll send them the ticket link for approval. We'll send them art for approval. Once they approve the ticket link and the art, we have the date and time set to go on sale. We announce and we go on sale to the public with the show. Uh, you know, a slow day, you might work on five to 10 shows a, a day, a, a busy, day you might work on 20 to 30 shows a day and not all shows confirm you will work on this process and sometimes you won't come to an agreement agent will be asking for more money than you're willing to offer or you offer too little and the agent you just for some reason can't come to an agreement and the show drops or the band gets sick and decide they can't go on tour anymore or the band gets offered a bigger tour taylor swift's going on tour and they want you know girl in red to open so all those holds that you were holding are now gone because they're going on tour with taylor swift it's very much a business of being able to be loose being able to be flexible being able to roll with the punches and go with the flow because everything can change on a day-to-day -day basis artist doesn't have over a million monthly listeners on Spotify and if an artist doesn't have at least a handful of songs with over a million plays it's not even something that I even take a look at to be honest and a lot of those plays can come from a multitude of different ways you can have a song that can go viral on TikTok and that will correlate to your Spotify plays increasing you can have a song that gets licensed on a TV show like Stranger Things, and that can increase your Spotify plays. Those kind of things kind of give you a determination of how popular a band is, how big they are, and how well they'll do in the market. Back in the day, it used to be terrestrial radio. You know, how many spins is a band getting on a radio station? Nowadays, it doesn't matter because no one listens to radio stations. Everyone listens to everything on Spotify or TikTok, to be honest. It is really exciting to see these develop because it does give smaller independent artists a somewhat equal playing field. Now, it's not, it's not always gonna be equal. I mean, especially when a record label can throw multi-millions of dollars behind advertising and promoting. But at the end of the day, a good song is a good song and the cream will rise to the top. Uh, a perfect example of that is Little Nas X. Little Nas X recorded and self-produced Old Town Road without the help of a major label. That went viral on TikTok and then because of that, it went viral on Spotify, got added to a million playlists, and became the biggest song of the year without the help of a major label. Now, does that happen all the time? No. But does it happen? Yes. You still look at bands like Billie Eilish. Her and her brother recorded that first album in their bedroom. Still happens. You know, Beck recorded his first album in his by himself playing all the instruments and won a Grammy. These happen because these people are extremely talented musicians. Beck is an extremely talented musician. Billie Eilish and her brother are extremely talented musicians. Little Nas X is an extremely talented musician. Now, usually a record label, their goal is to find these people before they can blow up on their own. But because of these platforms, because of TikTok, because of Spotify, now, when a major label comes to these artists, they have more power to negotiate a better deal for themselves 
because they're already making the money from Spotify. What can you do that I can't already do myself? And that goes to a lot of smaller independent artists too. You don't have to be Lil Nas X or Billie Eilish. You can have a song on Spotify that gets a few million plays because you got added to a playlist and you can make tens of thousands of dollars off that song and do just fine. I manage a band called Bogan Via and we have a song that has 3 million plays on Spotify. We, it got added to a bunch of playlists because we own the rights to that. We've probably made 30 or $40,000 just off that one song, just off the Spotify, not including Apple, iTunes, any of that kind of stuff. You know, you can also make money on licensing. In small independent bands, you can hire somebody who can place your music in TV shows. Back in the day, that that wasn't really an option. That was only an option for major bands. You look at you look at a thing, a TV show like Stranger Things, and yes, they have big artists like Metallica and Kate Bush, but they also had a lot of smaller artists. Uh, they had a placement for a local band from Arizona in the 80s called Gentlemen After Dark, which I ended up putting out a record for on my record label. And you have these opportunities where that band in the 80s, they weren't placed in any TV shows. Their song was Spotify didn't exist in the 80s. Uh, if they didn't get on radio, no one knew who they were. Now that band is getting a second chance at life, similar with Kate Bush. Her single, Running Up That Hill, came out in 1985. It did okay, had it was on some, you know, radio stations, but it's it's now having a second life due to placements on streaming services and getting added on playlists on Spotify and getting added to videos on TikTok. You can really do a lot for an artist and their music. So this entire industry is 100% built on your relationships. It, it's your relationship with the agent. It's your relationship with the manager. It's your relationship with the artist themselves. And that's on the booking side. On the other side, it's your relationship with the local venue, who, who owns and operates the venue, who books the venue. It's your relationship with the local bands. Who are the local bands in your community? Who's going to open these shows and play these shows and help promote the shows? It's your local relationships with the local record stores. Is, is Zia Records going to help me give out tickets for the show? Are they going to let me put up their poster? Are they going to help pass out flyers? Is Stinkweeds going to let me put up posters and pass out flyers and give away tickets? It's, it's all of those relationships. Um, backline companies. I have a touring band coming through or a DJ coming through and they don't have any equipment. I need to get equipment. All right, who can I contact in Phoenix to rent equipment and get that backline equipment? It's your sound technicians. All right, I'm doing a show here. Who's my sound guy? Who can advance the show and answer all the questions for the band coming to town? Who's going to make sure that the band sounds good? All right, I'm doing a show in some weird place that's not a normal music venue. What sound guy can I call that can come and do that sound? What production company can I call to rent the equipment, to rent the speakers, to rent the stage? What local record stores can I contact to help me promote this show and make it as good as possible? What local bands can I contact to open and make this show or this event bigger and better than ever? And then how's that relationship with that artist and that manager and that agent because they're going to come to town. They're going to say, oh, this is a great place. I love this place. Oh, that band that opened, that band was awesome. Oh, that flyer you made, that was great. That in-store that we did at the record store, that was amazing. That helped our show tremendously. And all of this helps to symbiotically grow your relationships with everyone and the artist and help grow that artist in your market. Ultimately, that's your goal, is that if you can take an artist from a small following and help grow their following in a market, 
and you can continuously do bigger and better shows with that artist. So it's 100% all about all your relationships. I think if you are just starting out in this industry, the most important skills you can have are building relationships um, and, and knowledge. Knowing, knowing your scene, knowing your community, and knowing the right people to talk to and develop relationships with. Who are the local bands playing in town? Where are those local bands playing? Who are the promoters putting on the shows? What venues are they playing at? Are they playing at Valley Bar? Are they playing at Rhythm Room? Are they playing at the Rebel Lounge? Wh you know, are they playing at Crescent Ballroom? Who are these local bands? Getting yourself as immersed into your scene and your community as possible. If you like hip hop, are you going to all of the Universitile music shows? Do you know who the hot acts are that are coming up? Are you, are you helping that scene in that community in any way, shape or form? Are you posting about it on your Instagram? Are you going on the Facebook event page? Did you buy a ticket? Uh, if you're into electronic music, do you know what Relentless Beats is? Do you know where they're doing their shows? Do you know who the local DJs are that are opening? Are you going to these events? Are you talking to these people? Are you saying, hey man, that was great. I love your set, you know? Are you gaining the knowledge for the music that you like? And the more time and energy that you spend in that, the more knowledge you gain, the more relationships you gain. You go to the same, the same promotion company's concerts for a year, you're gonna know who are the local bands playing the shows, what are the venues they're playing at, who's the person putting on the show. Eventually you might meet the, the talent buyer for that venue. Hey, you know, I really like the shows you guys are doing. You might meet the local band. They're going and selling their merch after the show, going up and saying, hi, I loved your set. That was great. Can I buy a record? Can I help? Can I, can I be a part of this community? And eventually you build those relationships to the point where, you know, there's, there's a band that you really like or a DJ that you really like or a hip hop artist that you really like. And you say, you know what? I can do this. I want to do a show for them. You know, you go and find out how much does it cost to rent Valley Bar? How much does it cost to rent Rebel Lounge? Okay, there's a local band. What, how much is that local band? How much do they want to play a show? Okay, if my rent is this much and the local band is this much and I spend this much on making some flyers and posters, can I get this many people to come and cover my expenses? And that's kind of how you start just jumping in, getting your feet wet. In this day and age, analytics is a hundred percent. I could not do my job without analytics. Ultimately, a band or a musician has to make good music. I listen to every single artist that I book. If I don't like the music, I tend not to book the band. You have to look at the data and see, okay, how many monthly listeners does this band have on Spotify? What are their top five tracks and how many plays do each of those top five tracks have? You look at their Instagram or their TikTok. How many followers do they have on Instagram? How many followers do they have on TikTok? Uh, you look at their YouTube channel. Uh, how many how many monthly subscribers are on their YouTube channel? How many how many videos have over a million plays on their YouTube channel? And you kind of get okay. This is in general how big this band is. Now that may not be specific for your market. It may you be okay. This band has you know a million monthly listeners. They have a couple of songs with a couple of million plays on Spotify and YouTube. They've got a million followers on Instagram. Okay, what, 
they may only be big in New York and LA and Chicago and Austin. Doesn't mean that they're big in Phoenix. How do I find out that how many people that band is worth in Phoenix? We as concert promoters have a couple of tools uh, that we can use. A big one is Polestar. Polestar is a reporting system that talent buyers use as a collective of buyers across the entire country. If a band comes to town after the end of the show, I can plug into this database. This band did this many people paid. These were the ticket prices. This is what the show grossed. And you can kind of see how a band is doing across the country. Okay, has this band played in my market before? Okay, if they played in my market before, how many people came? What were the ticket prices? What did the show gross and what was the guarantee? Do I think the band is bigger or smaller than the last time they came? Okay, if the band hasn't played my market before, what's a similar market? So I book in Phoenix, a similar market to Phoenix is Houston and Dallas. So if I'm looking at a band and they've never played in Phoenix before, but they've played in Houston or Dallas, I can look up and say, okay, how many people paid at their last show in Houston or Dallas? How, what were the ticket prices? What, what was the gross of the show? What did the band get paid? And I can kind of put those numbers together and say, okay, based on all that information, I think that the band is worth this many people. I think we can charge this much. I think the show can gross this much money. That's kind of on a smaller independent scale. On a larger scale, working for a company like Live Nation, we have some proprietary technology that we use that works with all of the other talent buyers for Live Nation across the country. We're on weekly calls where we have a lot of open communication with each other. We say, you know, this band is, is looking for an offer. What are you guys offering this band? What are the ticket prices in your market? And we can kind of look, okay, how, does this band have any history? Has this band played before? How, how much has this band grossed? What have been the ticket prices? And we can use all, you basically have to be a human calculator and just add all of this stuff up in your head, divide it and say, okay, what makes sense? Can I, can I make the math work? Can I, can I make this show profitable or not? That, that technology is 100% crucial and I use it every single day in my day-to-day -day booking. As far as talent buying goes, your main tools are going to be those social media, the TikTok, the Instagram, the Spotify, the YouTube, checking those numbers. And then as far as finals from previous shows go, it's going to be Polestar and uh, for Live Nation, they've got their own uh, they've got their own software that they use. Other companies have their own software as well. AEG is a major concert promotion company in the nation, and I'm sure they have their own software that they use as well to gather finals. As far as say marketing goes, a marketing agent can basically go into Google Analytics, can go into Facebook and Instagram Analytics and see impressions of an artist and can kind of see how big they are in each of the markets. Spotify has uh, those internal numbers too. If you're a manager for a band, you can get a breakdown of this is how many plays my band gets in Phoenix, Houston, LA, San Diego. And you can kind of see your markets as a manager for your artist in Spotify, which is, which is a great tool uh, as a manager. If you are an artist, the best way to promote your music is make music, M make good songs, write as many songs as possible, hone your craft, do as good of a 
ability as you can. Record those songs, get them uploaded to as many platforms as possible, get them on SoundCloud, get them on Spotify. And there, there are many easy ways to do that. The CD Baby, TuneCore, there's plenty of ways where you can upload your own music to these platforms. Get the music up on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes. And then from there, uh, using, utilizing your social media. Make sure you have a TikTok page. Make sure you have an Instagram page. Make sure you're actively posting. Make sure that you're actively communicating with your fan base. Build that up to the point where somebody's willing to take a chance on you and do a show or take a chance on yourself and book your own show. Find, find a venue and find out how much it is to rent and put on your own show. Invite some friends down, have them come out, showcase your music, F be friends with other local bands, ask them to come play a show with you. Ask if you can open a show for them, build those relationships. Once again, it all comes back down to those relationships. Nothing is made in a bubble. You, if you make music in your bedroom and you don't ever talk to anyone and you don't ever upload your music, no one's going to know you exist. Uh, it, it's, you have to have a little bit of self-promotion and getting that out there for yourself if you want somebody else to take a chance on you. And, and ultimately, it's, it's having fun. If you form a band, it's usually because you're friends with a bunch of guys and you want to hang out and you guys want to make music together. If you're part of a scene and a community, you're, you're making those relationships with other artists. If you're a rapper and there's another rapper that you like, ask them to do a collab. Ask them to throw down a verse on your track. If you're an electronic music producer and there's this local band that you like and you really like their vocals, offer to do a trade. Say, hey, I really love your vocals. Would you sing on one of my tracks? I'll do a remix for you. It happens all the time. It's all about just getting out there and doing it, you know, and and working. And, and it's, you know, it's the hustle. It's you, you do it because you love it. And hopefully that turns into a profitable business or it doesn't. And it's just fun and it's art, which is totally fine and acceptable too. There's, that's the beauty of art is that you don't have to make it for other people. You make it for yourself and what, hopefully other people like it or they don't. And it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you should be having fun with it. If, if you're not having fun, what, what are you doing? As a student and as a young person getting into this industry, I think it's good to dip your toes into a variety of different things. When I first started, I promoted concerts, but because I promoted concerts, I also learned about marketing and advertising, and I also learned about ticketing. And I also learned about box office and I also learned about contracts and deposits. And I also learned how to settle the show. And then I also learned about artist management and what that takes. And I also learned about record labels and what that takes. And don't, don't feel like you at 18 or 19 or 20 or 21, you have to have a very specific focus, try a bunch of things and see what like, what you like and what works for you. And then from there, try to narrow it down and really focus on what you want to do. Do you want to go into artist management? Are you, are you an artist yourself? Do you want to be an artist? Do you want to get into promotion? Do you want to start a promotion company? Do you want to get into owning and operating live venues? Do you want to be a production manager? Do you want to be a sound tech? Do you want to be a marketing director. Do you like creating art and concert posters? That's an art form all onto itself. Find what you like and find what makes you happy and pursue that. And then from there, get as much experience as possible. Try to intern for a company. If you like electronic music, go intern for Relentless Beats. If you like hip hop, go intern for
for Universitile Music. If you like indie rock, go intern for Stateside Presents. If there's a club you really, really like, you really love seeing shows at the Van Buren. You really love seeing shows at the Nile. You really love seeing shows at the Marquee. Go and try to get a job there. Take any job, it doesn't matter. Take a job as security, take a job as box office, take a job, get, get, get in. What is, what is your in? And then from there, you can, you can make and develop relationships, okay? You may just be in the box office. That may not be what you want to do. Maybe you want to be a sound guy, but you're at the show and you get to see the sound guy and you can talk to the sound guy and maybe eventually you can get an internship and, and start doing sound. You really want to be on the marketing side, but there's no position opening, but you can, you can be a ticket taker or you can be an usher or you can be a security. Take that job and see where that path leads because you'll you'll never know and maybe maybe you'll be surprised maybe you really enjoy ticketing you really like building the ticket links and events and sending them off or you like you like marketing you like advertising and making cool posters or flyers i i think the biggest thing i can say is is literally just do it you know don't don't let anything stop you you know the only thing stopping you is yourself